Hello, my name is Dale Robert Schoon, and uh, I'm going to move a little, not off subject, but I'm going to take this program in a different direction than I have in the past. The, the title of this, the name of my program is Dollars and Cents, and I've talked a lot about money and how it differs from the pictures that you have, that we all have had about money, what it is and where it came from and how it's created, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera and the, the impact that it's had on our lives. Well, I still am going to talk about it, but I'm going to talk about money and power in, a, in a, with a different focus today, with a more of a geopolitical slant than I have in the past, and because it's important, because issues are moving quite rapidly today, and I'm, so this program, the specific one, I'm going to talk about Israel, and the following program, I'm going to talk about Iran. Now, you have noticed, I hope, those of you who watch this program, is that I tell stories. I tell the history of money. I tell the history of how it developed. I talk about the central banks. I talk about history a lot. Why? Well, because history is a story. Now, one of the things they say about history is really true. And the, that truth is, history is written by the victors. Now. I think you've noticed that the history I tell you is quite different than the history you've been told. That the story I tell you about money is quite different than the stories you've been told about money, where it comes from, how it operates, and why things are the way to, they are today. I have a very, very different story about money than the ones you read about, for example, in the news, in the Wall Street Journal, CNBC, anything out there today. Now, I'm going to talk about Israel in the same way. And I suspect that what I'm going to tell you about Israel is quite different than the stories you've heard about it. Now, it may appear to you that you're a victim in all this, all right, that you have very little power. But it occurred to me that's not true. Because if it were true, they wouldn't even bother telling you the stories that they told you. They wouldn't have bothered to lie to you in the first place. They wouldn't have taken the extraordinary amount of time to manipulate your worldview into one that coincides with the worldview they want you to have. So your power is basically something that they want to control and manipulate. So what I'm going to do today is just tell you another story. All right? Like I've told you about money, like I've told you about central banks, this time we're going to talk about the state of Israel. Now, what we, Israel especially, the mind likes to go white and black. This is true, this isn't true, this is, that's true, that's not true. I hope at the end of the program today, you're going to have a different view about Israel than what we've gone in. But I don't want you to have the view that I have. I don't want you to have the view that you used to have. I'm just going to introduce certain facts another story about events that have happened that may open you up into viewing the world and Israel in a, in a slightly different way than you view it today. Not necessarily right, not necessarily wrong, but broader in that sense. Now, I know that when you turn on the news, what you see is, Bruh. Israel, 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 Israel in, in relationship to what's happening in maybe Syria or what's happening maybe in relationship to Egypt or what's happening on the West Bank or what's happening here or what's happening there. Let's go back to the establishment of the state of Israel and where it came from and why it actually arose. Now, there was no state of Israel until, in fact, there wasn't even anything there of the Jews in the Middle East until 1948. When the UN passed a resolution establishing not the state of Israel, but establishing the, the, uh, an area where the Israelis could return. All right? Now, UN resolution. What was behind the re UN resolution that established this? Because not all Jews wanted this to happen. The Jewish people themselves were split over whether the political state of Israel would be a good thing or a bad thing. And even today, the Israelis, the Jews themselves, are not of one mind on this. Many of them still believe that the state of a Zionist state of Israel would have a very, very negative effect 
on the religious attitude of the Jews. But be that as it may, let's just go back and redial up what happened in 1948. In 1948, the resolution to establish Israel, or the right of the Jews to return to their state, was introduced by the British. Now, why did the British have a stake in all this? Why did England, why did Britain, why did they step forward and choose to establish a state that has had extraordinary ramifications on the world stage today? Much of the uncertainty in the world right now is because of the Middle East. And much of that uncertainty derives from the establishment of Israel in the Middle East. Now, who established that? People say Ben-Gurion was the father of Israel. Let me tell you, if Ben-Gurion was the, in fact the father of Israel, whoever was the mother of Israel had a lover on the side. And that lover was Winston Churchill. Winston Churchill is the true father of the state of Israel. Ben-Gurion may have been the first president, but if it weren't for Winston Churchill, there never would be an Israel today. Winston Churchill went to the UN, went to everybody, did a little arm twisting, and created this what we now call the state of Israel eventually. Now, when he first started doing this, and you, got, you should really ask the question, why? Why did Winston Churchill do this? Why did England do this? Well, Winston Churchill and England owed the Jews a debt. Why? Because I think I, you've learned enough from my previous programs about the power of England and how England was transformed from a very small island nation off the northwest coast of France into a world power in 150 years. I mean, they, Germany was bigger than England, all right? France was a large, a lot bigger than England. And yet England, in 150 years, went from a dinky small country to ruling the world, the largest empire since Rome. Why? Well, what I talked about, and what I've been always talking about England, was the source of their power was their banking system. England could go to war on credit. This allowed England to leverage war into a vast empire that they were able to run as long as they kept winning. And if they could go to war on credit, nobody else could, they had an advantage nobody else had. So by the middle of the 19th century, England had an empire on which the sun didn't set literally. All right? Now, the Jews, Israel and banking. It wasn't the Jews, who are now associated with banking, that created this opportunity for England to do so. It was the Scots, all right? It was William Patterson, a Scotsman, who approached the King of England in 1694 and offered him a deal. And the deal was this. You let us set up a central bank, and we will loan you enough money to pay off your war debts and loan you the money to do whatever you want as long as you pay us back. Now, the king, all he cared about was going to war. He didn't really care about money. He should have, because in the end, the bankers really ended up owning England. All right? But this is how they did In fact, the bank, I just recently learned that the charter of the Bank of England did not give them the right to issue banknotes. Money! It didn't. It gave them the right to do certain things, and it gave them the right to conveyance of credit and debt, et cetera, et cetera. Well, what the British, what the bankers did is that they made the banknotes to the bearer, good to the bearer. And the bearer was anybody who got the banknotes. So if you were English and had a banknote, this became money. Because you had the rights of the bearer to exchange it for gold or whatever, it became money. That's how the bankers stuck their foot in in the door of England and achieved the huge amount of power that bankers have today. Bankers did not even have buildings in 1694. They had nothing before William Patterson cut this deal with the King of England. Well, where did the Jews come in? Well, <coughs> the sons and daughters of Israel were basically shunned in Europe. A lot of anti-Semitism. They blamed Jesus' death on the Jews. And if you have a, any cursory reading of the Bible, you will understand that Jews, even though they did go, at least the publicans, the powerful Jewish lobby went and lobbied 
you know, the Romans to crucify Jesus because of the trouble that he was causing, basically about the money changers, that Jesus basically told the disciples that this had to happen. They said, listen, get out of here. Don't get out of Jerusalem. They're going to they're gonna na nail you up. They're after you. And Jesus said, listen, for me to do what I'm here to do, it has to happen. For me, for the Holy Spirit to come into your lives and give you the powers and the truth that the Holy Spirit's going to give you, I have to do this. Now, the disciples, they just didn't want to see him go. Jesus said, this has to happen. So if anybody was responsible, or at least partly responsible for Jesus, it was Jesus himself. But be that as it may, anti-Semitism spread throughout Europe, odd man out, and the Jews ended up being outsiders, and the only th way they were allowed to make a living by the Catholic Church was by either the selling of used clothing or loaning money. Why? Because the Catholic Church itself had outlawed the loaning of money for profit, usury. Okay? This was, this was a mortal sin in the Catholic Church. The Muslims outlawed. It was illegal for Muslims to engage in loaning of money. All right? So here are the Jews. We're sitting there basically loaning money, you know, at interest. And this, they, they, were, they were good at it. All right? But they were still in trouble for doing so. Now, so what happened is the king of England allowed these Scotsmen to come in and do what the Jews had been doing for a few hundred years. All right? For dispensation. Well, 100 years later, the Jews figured the game out. And it was through the House of Rothschilds that they came into England in a big way. By the middle of the 18th century, this small, this group of bankers, first out of Germany, the Rothschilds, moved in and basically dominated the banking system of Europe. All right? In England, not only, they ended up running the Royal Mint. All right? In England, they ended up as the largest syndicator of loans to the government of England. So what the bankers had done, the Scotsmen had done, is set up a system where the biggest profits could be made by the printing of paper bank notes, issuing them in the form of loans, and making money from the interest. How did, how did bankers make money before this? Well, they used to loan gold and silver and charge interest on gold and silver. Well, I'll tell you, there's a lot more paper money floating around than gold and silver, and it's a lot more profitable. And that's where the bankers really got into the game, big time, by loaning governments money. Governments are so huge today because they live off of borrowed money. This is true in England. This is true in the United States. This is true in Japan. This is true all over the world. But in the middle of the 18th century, the Jews in England came to be the bankers to the government of England, to the House of Windsor. All right? England was the best bank, was the best government to loan money to because they knocked over the world. They basically owned the world. So if you were loaning money to the English Empire, you were in like Flint. All right? Now, this is the middle of the 18th century. The 19th century comes along, the Rothschilds turn it down. They don't want anybody to know who they are. They don't know anybody. Because once you're too rich, you're a target. And they knew that it's as, many, as well as anybody else. Now, so it was the Jewish banking houses that got very, very powerful, first because of the Rothschilds, then the bearings, then uh, the names. The names of almost all the big banking houses were Jewish, even in the United States. The Lehman Brothers, Bear Stearns, they were Jewish. Okay, the, J.P. Morgan was, was a major banker. He wasn't Jewish, but the, it was the Rothschilds' money behind J.P. Morgan. When he died, they, 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 they settled his estate, and he wasn't that rich. And they go, how can this man, who basically controlled the finances of America, do it on so little money? It was because he was a front man for the Rothschilds. All right? So the banking influence in England was enormous, simply because England lived on borrowed money. And after the mid-19th century, the House of Rothschilds had come to dominate banking in Europe and in England, especially England, but also Europe. They controlled banking everywhere in Europe. They didn't get into banking in the United States until 1913 with the establishment of the Federal Reserve. All right? And the owners of the Federal Reserve Bank were a consortium of mainly European banks. And I will guarantee you, though we don't know, because this is secret and they still won't tell anybody who owns the bank of the, the Federal Reserve Bank, that it, they're front banks for the Rothschilds, for the Barings, for the, all, the, all the boys who were back there in the 19th century. All right? Be that as it may, 
when the horrors of World War II were over. And they were horrors, especially for the Jews. No one will dispute that unless the people who call themselves Holocaust deniers, and they really do it just to make the Jews mad. I mean, maybe they believe there was no Holocaust, but these people, people believe anything. All you got to do is say it, and there's somebody going to believe it, and if somebody believes it, he'll tell his friend, and one of them will believe it. So really, the truth is not established by what people are willing to believe, because people will believe anything, absolutely anything. All right? Well, what happened is, after the end of World War II, the Zionists, which had been building up a head of steam in the, in the Jewish community, wanted a homeland. Now, like I said before in the beginning of this program, this was not a 100% deal on the part of the Jews. A lot of the especially religious Jews, the Orthodox Jews, were opposed to the establishment of a Jewish political homeland. All right. The Rothschilds were a case in point. Some of the Rothschilds were Zionists. I mean, after all, if you grew up and, you know, the Jewish question was there, what would you, well, they go, well, do you think we ought to have a homeland? Well, your brother goes, yes, and you go, well, I'm not sure. They're nobody, they're not different than anybody else, except they're who they are. What happened was they, they went to Winston Churchill and they said, listen, Winston, you owe us something. He goes, what? You, we want a homeland. We want our own land. After we went through the Holocaust and all these people died. And he goes, I mean, hey, Winston Churchill was a politician. And he knew that England owed the bankers their power, which was considerable. So what Winston Churchill did, since the Jews wanted their homeland in Palestine, their native land where they all the Bible stories are written. He had to finesse this thing. So he went to the king of Saudi Arabia, who's the most powerful man in the Middle East at that time. All the oil was coming out of there, you know, about to come out of there, and it had to come out of there. And, and this, it was a memorable conversation. He, he sits there and has this conversation with the king of Saudi Arabia, and he tells him, uh, listen, um, we are going to, we, England, the United Nations, we're going to establish a Palest land for the Israelis, for the Jews, back in the Middle East. And the king of Saudi Arabia goes, oh, why? I mean, you know, they haven't been around for a long time. I mean, any more than anybody else has. But they haven't had a state for at least 2,000 years. And he says, well, it's because of what happened to the Holocaust. You know, the terrible, the millions of Jews that died during it. And the king of Saudi Arabia looked at Winston Churchill and said, well, why don't you give them Bavaria? <laughs> like, you know? I mean, the Germans did it to them. We didn't. Give them some part of Germany. Well, as history tells it, they didn't. So they gave him some land in Palestine. Now, the land they give him, they gave them wasn't empty. It wasn't like, you know, Death Valley, you know, where nobody was living, all right? They gave them part of Palestine. People have been living there, Palestinians. You know, there's some Jews were there. There was a lot of people there. But mainly they were Arabs and they are Palestinians and they lived there, all right? Well, they didn't have the right to give them a state in the beginning. They just said, you have the right to live there. Well, what they basically did was they took a bulldozer and shoved all those people living there over this line. And they said, you guys go over there. The Jews are going to live here and started letting them in. All right. Well, that's a deal that the Jews remember. The return to homeland, the diaspora was over. The Bible said to them it was going to be true and all sorts of stuff like that. All right? Blah, 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 blah. Now, the Arabs had a quite a different thought about it. Holy smokes. I mean, what do we do? They were never paid. They were never given any money. They were never given anything. They were just kicked off the land. Now, what would you do if somebody came in after a couple thousand years and said, uh, hey, my, uh, this is our land. God gave it to me. Well, you know, you got your own God too. 
And your God didn't say, hey, uh, you're living on leased land, on borrowed time. This land really belongs to the Israelis, so when they come back, you got to leave. No, their God didn't tell them that. Okay? The Jews said, our God told them, this is our land forever. All right? So they moved them off, and fighting started. Naturally, fighting started. What would happen if a bunch of Jews came to Louisiana, all right, and said, this is the homeland of the state of Israel and the New World, and we're going to live here, and New Orleans is going to be our capital? Well, I'll tell you, every one of you southern crackers that love the state of Israel would have a gun, and you'd start shooting. I mean, they may move you out of New Orleans, but you're going to be in there taking shots at them, all right? Because you used to live there. They just kicked you out of there. Well, what the Jews did is they started shooting back, all right? A lot of those early Jewish settlements were basically what we call terrorists, okay? Terrorism. They had a fight. Who won? Well, the Jews won. Why? Because they had the state of, they had the UN behind them. They had... England behind them. They had the West behind them. Now, what happened this week in Israel is really stunning because Israel has been building. They, they were given so much land. All right, you, you guys stay here. But then they started moving off that land. They started putting settlements on somebody else. They, they weren't content with the land they'd been given. They wanted more of the land that they thought God gave us this whole goddamn thing. All right? I mean, we ought to live over there and there and there and there. So they start building these settlements outside where the UN said they were, had this new state. These are called illegal settlements. All right? And this week, the UN Commission on Human Rights said these settlements are illegal. And everybody knew they were illegal. But now the UN has said they are illegal. Well, I want to read you something about it. This is 2013. All right? I want to read you something that the father of Israel said about this a long time ago. Winston Churchill. All right? Winston Churchill said this a long time ago. This is before the state of Israel even emerged. And this is what he said in 1937. The wealthy, crowded, progressive Jewish state, he saw this, this is foreknowledge, lies in the plains and on the seacoast of Palestine, around it in the hills and the uplands, striking far and wide into the illimitable deserts, the warlike Arabs of Syria, of Transjordia, of Arabia, backed by the armed forces of Iraq, offer the ceaseless menace of war. To maintain itself, the Jewish state will have to be armed to the teeth and must bring in every able-bodied man to strengthen its army. But how long will this process be allowed to continue by the great Arab populations in Iraq and Palestine? Can it be expected that the Arabs would stand by impassively and watch the building up with Jewish world capital and resources of a Jewish army equipped with the most deadly weapons of war until it was strong enough not to be afraid of them? And if ever the Jewish army reached that point, who can be sure that cramped within their narrow limits would they not plunge into the new undeveloped lands that lay around them. 1937, far before the establishment of Israel in the Middle East, Winston Churchill saw what would happen. Israel would become a nation armed to the teeth, backed by the West, encroaching on more Arab land because they wanted it. Now, a funny thing. Most of the people in Israel want peace. Most of the people that we read about, they're all for war, and certainly the country is. Netanyahu, I mean, he makes, ah, well, Netanyahu, let, let's set aside. But Israelis, the majority of Israelis don't want war with the Palestinians. They want the Palestinians to have a homeland. But the Israelis have no more power in Israel than Americans do in the United States.